Raise your hand if you've ever had a bad day, ever in your life. Okay, <laughs> looks like all of us. Um, now, raise your hand if you've ever had a bad day that started with something small. Could be your alarm didn't go off, someone cut you off going to work or school, or you posted an Instagram photo and didn't get the likes you deserve. Anybody? <laughs> Too often. Okay, last question. How many of you then believe that a similarly small moment could improve your day, your week, maybe even your life? Yeah, it seems like kind of more of a stretch, doesn't it? Uh, but it would stand to reason that if a small thing could ruin your day, then a small thing should be able to improve it. Uh, but this is something that I didn't really think about or believe in until this particular bad day. It had been a long day. The kind of day where my motivation and procrastination couldn't decide which of the two looked better on me, so they dressed me in mediocrity and sent me on my way. On my way to a day where none of my childhood dreams came true, a day even Dr. Seuss probably would have rhymed with, Suckish. Where the most exciting thing that happened to me was that my gas light came on, and to top it all off, I'm stuck in line in my least favorite place, Walgreens. I hate Walgreens. Got me all excited about the membership. They like to price their product so high. The membership only served to bring them back down to reality. It is killing me. They call 35 cents off of greediness a bargain. And this hag in front of me is pulling out a checkbook lady. I am sure the 1930s were a swell time, but some things are not better the old-fashioned way, and her hands shake as she pays for her gallon of water, six bananas, loaf of bread, jar of peanut butter, apple granola bars, four bottles of Gatorade, two Hershey's chocolate bars, because why the hell not? Three packs of spearmint gum and those chocolate cakes from Hostess. And I only know this, because in the time it took for her to find that checkbook in that suitcase on her arm, they put a man on Neptune and, oh, <laughs> brilliant. She forgot the milk. And as we all wait for the store associate to run and grab her calcium liquid, I begin to associate this old woman with purgatory. This must be the stuck-behind-the-arthritic old lady at the grocery store level, and I am sure, for some, this level isn't that bad. But it's been a long day, and this woman smells like old people. I'm beginning to wonder how she escaped from the nursing home, but right before I can ask this fossil what the Great Depression was like, mercifully, the associate returns with her 1%, the cash register dings and opens. It's over. At least I didn't kill an old woman today. <laughs> she collects her belongings, and at a speed evolution would respect, moves so slowly to the door that I could scan my item, pay for it, grab my card, and receipt, go to leave, and she is just now reaching the front doors, where she's conveniently blocking the only exit. Old lady, you picked the wrong day to examine my morality. I surge to give her sharp push into the portrait frame of my day, but I miss because she's tricked me to surprisingly swift as she makes a sharp right. And as I stumble through the door, I struggle to regain composure as my mind works to clarify the scenario I am seeing. I pause as my day's largest mountain kneels down and the burden she carries is unloaded on the homeless man laying down at the front of the store with a sign that reads, you are loved, a gallon of water, six bananas, a loaf of bread, a jar of peanut butter, apple granola bars, four bottles of Gatorade, two Hershey's chocolate bars because why the hell not? Three packs of spearmint gum and those chocolate cakes from Hostess. And of course, the 1% milk almost forgotten that she empties every item in her bag for the first time today. My mind is quiet. As I bear witness to a development, this is what love looks like. With a smile and a wave, she says goodbye to the man who probably never know the name of the whisper of humanity on two legs walking away. But as she turns back to procure her original purpose, a stop her and ask her who she is. And with a smile, like a vaccine curing my melancholy disease, she says to me, I'm Ingrid. Ingrid, thank you for making this day beautiful. Thank you. So at Cometry, we blend comedy and poetry to tell stories and to educate. And this particular story is about a moment in my life in which I learned something new about someone that forced me to completely change the way that I saw them. And I really like telling this story, um, mainly because it makes me look bad. And we never like to do that. Uh, I mean, understandably, we typically only tell stories in which we are either the hero or the victim. I mean, how many of you tell stories that end in, and I learned a very valuable lesson that day? <laughs> We don't really like to talk about our chips, our cracks, our mistakes. But these things, just like our joys and successes, make us human. And they connect us to other humans, kind of like you saw in that poem. 
Life is full of these serendipitous moments if you're willing to be open to them. And openness comes from a willingness to learn about other people, other cultures, other walks of life, both their joys and their pains. I mean, I thought I had this older woman figured out. Clearly, Satan sent her here to test me. <laughs> but after learning just a little bit about her story, my perception changed. And it started to eliminate other small moments like this in my life and help me see them more clearly. I mean, how many of you have people in your lives that you feel like you've got figured out, maybe without ever saying a word to them? The slam poetry is this really powerful art form because it allows audiences the chance to not only see and hear these stories, but to really experience them, to feel them. And so to further highlight how small moments can really impact your life if you're willing to be open to them, I want to invite up the co-founder of Cometry to tell some of his story. Please help me welcome up Iggy Mawala. In the two weeks, he went sober. We drank coffee. We cleaned the house. Went down to the unemployment office together. Growing up, the local cops knew our names. Finding an off in our family. It was our religion. Every month, we had to sacrifice our father, take a pot to his head, and lay the drunk man out. The sirens, the tears, the AA classes, the court hearings, evictions never changed much. There were times I could beat him sober for days, but never long enough to get to know him beyond the alcoholic who only came around a basketball game screaming, That's my boy, my father, laid passed out in the neighbor's yard, the lawn ornament, relocating itself every week. My father, the drunk. We fought toe to toe and knuckle to knuckle. And after 22 years of it, I decided to work things out. I tried to understand why my father had so much anger released as a twist of a cap. For three years, I did swing on the man until this morning. A loud thump off the wall, a jaw hung open. My mother laid out across the floor, the pain wrinkling in her face. Flash, I remember a time he brought her to his knees, his hands locked around her arm like the jaws of a pit bull. So like any dog owner, I tap him in the throat. No air, no power. I be back to the moment as my father stands under the dim kitchen light with liquor splashing behind his yellow eyes. How could you push her like that? Your own wife. My mother, I slash again to the day he punches her, she hits the floor. Her brother and I flocked around my mind like birds do when a nest falls from its tree, praying she'd wake up. I breathe back to the moment, back into his yellow eyes, and jab. A quick stab to the midsection, his airbag is empty. He swings back, the bell is rung, we're at it again. Mother cheers me on, his bottom lip splits open, blood-stained drool. He's going to catch with his tongue, Well, I'll kill you. I heard the crowd going wild as I shove down his flimsy swings and knee to the stun him. His body falls limp, but there's no referee to stop me. I'm in love with the sound of knuckles hitting flesh. The aching beauty of a cue ball cracking the rack at the break. You like that? I like that. Addicted to adrenaline, holding 25 years of messed up childhood in my fist. His tattered body laser had no bones left. I kicked it. I stopped it. I put the head into the refrigerator. More concerned about that door than the head that dented it. My mother is crying again. I drag what has left my father into the empty hallway. At the sink, I loosen my knuckles, rinse our African blood from my hands. I watch my dignity and anger swirl towards the mouth of the basin. I'm late for my train. Outside the building, I'm greeted by a lovely custodian lady who can never say my name right. Hello, Aggie. How are you? I smile. I'm fine. Thanks.
During that time period of violence occurring frequently in the household, my days were dark, my days were heavy, and I remained distant from most people, discouraged due to the, the pain, due to the embarrassment, the bruises, and everything else that comes with emotional trauma. Up until then, I disclosed very little or nothing about my life, about Iggy. My story was stored in the closet. That day, I decided if he was not going to change, that I was going to change. I vowed never to fight father again and live a life that was healthier for me, which started with sharing my shame. My story fell upon the ears of my high school basketball coach, Mr. Cavisto. I moved in, found a family, and became family. The beginnings of building a series of events of more chances. I share that with you to show just how influential openness can be. In this moment, I feel closer to you guys. And it may be mutual. You may feel closer to me. Openness or sharing your story breeds higher chances of others understanding or empathizing with you, which could lead to an influx of serendipitous moments. Now, I would hope you don't have to experience complete loneliness, or I would hope you don't have to discover the many different hues of emotional bruises before you're willing to be open. Being vulnerable, being authentic, will take courage, but I encourage you to do so. Sharing my story was one of the hardest things I've ever done. But since then, I feel more hopeful for my future. That hopefulness comes from knowing that they will be there with me. I became comfortable in learning that I was not the only one. I was just like many who don't share emotions. And what's kind of funny is in sharing my story, I began to connect more. Others were gravitating towards me. And what was interesting is in doing so, it gave them trust to share their stories with me. The act of sitting fully in your emotions and practicing transparency allows other people to feel seen, to feel like they matter, to feel like they exist. So let's practice today. Because maybe some of you are thinking connecting with other people is challenging, or perhaps outside your comfort zone. Well, I'm going to invite Andre back to the stage, and we're going to demonstrate just where openness can begin. And we're going to treat this room here as our honesty laboratory. So this is going to be an interactive exercise. Simply raise your hand if the following questions apply to you. And we'll sort of see if openness and honesty can help develop connections. Raise your hand if you've ever said goodbye to somebody, and then you start walking the same direction. <laughs> so then you start walking a little slower, or a little faster, so you're not walking next to them. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever been alone in a room, so you let out a toot, and then someone immediately walks into the room, mm. and you just pretend like it smelled that way the whole time. Yeah. That's is, that, uh, is that cabbage? That must weird. Broccoli. It's just Somebody's strange in here, I guess. Boiling broccoli. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever wanted to try out for a musical, or a sports team, or a club meeting, but you didn't because you're worried about what other people thought. Hmm. It's you, security. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you think about the future and it makes you kind of anxious. Mm. <laughs> Raise your hand if you feel guilty about canceling plans on a friend just so you can sit at home and do nothing. <laughs> mm. Netflix is real. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And finally, raise your hand if you've secretly been looking around the room to see who was raising their hands and who didn't, but clearly feels the same way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being open and honest with us. We hope that you now discover that you have more in common with those around you. We hope that you practice being open so you can foster more serendipitous moments. That's also how you practice empathy, and empathy is what helps us develop the genuine connections we need with the people around us to kind of help us get through life. Like you heard in my poem earlier, it was a moment of kindness that not only changed the way that I saw this person, but it also uplifted my day. And that was just this person being authentically who they were and me being open to receiving that. And you heard in my story how dark it was, how low my emotions were for me to be open. But practicing being open allowed me to create this performance group that now teaches how to be emotionally unreserved or teaches empathy, which led us to our own serendipitous moment with you here today. <coughs> Practice being open. Practice being authentic so you can foster more serendipitous moments in your life. Thank, Thank you. you.